the narrow trail wound in and out between clumps of giant bamboo that rose on every side, the tall graceful fronds arching like huge bouquets of elegant feathery blooms. It was the time when the bamboo tree was seeding, when each length of cane was crowded at its tip, with tufts consisting of thousands of tiny seeds. These seeds looked like ripe grains of wheat, yet the weight of thousands of them was enough to bend each frond low to the earth, creaking and groaning under its burden as it moved with the gentle breezes passing along the jungle aisles. The seeds fell in showers, carpeting the earth and the narrow path, with a thick layer that mostly decayed, but here and there showed signs of sprouting into tiny dark green seedlings. This carpet felt like sawdust and had a springy consistency. It deadened the sound of anything moving over it, and of the killer that now stalked from bamboo clump to bamboo clump in search of a meal. Overhead thousands of parakeets screeched as they hung by their feet, head downwards above the twisting trail, pecking the seeds with their razor-sharp curved beaks, deftly severing the husk from the kernel, which they crushed to a fine powder before swallowing. They were small compared with other members of the parrot family, being about twice the size of the domesticated budgerigar. But they were of many hues, ranging from emerald green to peacock blue, some with pale yellow wing feathers and heads of rose pink or deep purple, and others of a uniform green, ringed around the neck with a narrow collar of red and black. A lone traveler, walking cautiously along the jungle trail, did not heed the parakeets nor the thousands of other birds, including wild pigeons and doves that fed on the seeds of the bamboos. He gazed intently ahead and glanced furtively to either side, slowing down and even halting now and then to study particularly dense clump of bamboo before drawing level with it. His sharp restless eyes tried to penetrate the thick growth to see if anything was hidden there. His ears were alert for sounds, far different from and far more arresting than the raucous, strident screech of the parakeets. The sounds he was listening for and dreading to hear were the sharp crack of a bamboo branch being broken, or the deep rumble of contented feeding, or the swishing sweep of ponderous feet brushing through the carpet of seeds and decaying leaves. The man was afraid of meeting a wild elephant or a herd of them, for there were many in this area, especially at this time of year. But his hearing was not attuned to the approach of the killer, who first sensed and then saw him. The killer made no sound whatever, unlike the screaming, fluttering birds above or the ponderous elephants beneath, engrossed in their search for vegetable food. This killer was by no means harmless, nor was he a vegetarian. He dealt death swiftly and surely, and he was at this moment very hungry indeed. The man was a Pujari, a member of an aboriginal jungle tribe that inhabits the forests of the Salem district in southern India, and the trail he was following was the footpath that led through the forest from the hamlet of Ayur, southwards for about ten miles to the still smaller hamlet of Manchi, nestling on the slopes of a great range of hills. The path ran down a valley, as also did a rocky stream, the two crossing and recrossing frequently and sometimes running parallel to each other while the hills towered on both sides to east and west in an unbroken chain of jungle. The narrow path was visible now and again, but disappeared as suddenly beneath the tall swaying bamboos as they moved to the gentle currents of the forest breeze. Fine webs, almost invisible, frequently caught and tickled the face of the pujari whose attention was wholly concentrated on the possible presence of the elephants. He brushed them off angrily with both hands, much to the annoyance of the large, long-legged yellow and black and red spiders, whose webs extended from tree to tree, secured by gossamer-like threads that were unbelievably strong supporting a central area of web 8 or 10 feet in diameter. The dew had condensed on these webs, and drops of moisture glistened in the sunlight, that filtered through the bamboo fronds. All was still, all was peaceful, except for the din of the feeding birds. Hira, the pujari passed a dense clump of bamboo after making certain, no elephant sheltered behind, but failed to see the killer in its black and rusty coat, that crouched low to the earth and stared at him, with malevolent, unblinking eyes. The man heard a coughing roar twice, then the tiger charged. Hira whirled around, as a great shape with widely extended jaws engulfed him. The pujari screamed, but once, he screamed no more. The birds that had ceased chattering for the moment, when the tragedy was enacted, started to screech again and from the side of the pathway, came the crunch and crack of bones as the tiger began his meal. Away on the hillside, a troop of langur monkeys had been feeding joyously, their cries of whoop, whoop, echoing across the narrow valley. Then the sharp hearing of the langur watchman caught the distant sound of the tiger's roars and the fainter, futile, agonized human scream. 
he knew that the tiger had made his kill, and the hoarse guttural langer alarm cry issued from his lips as he stood on his hind legs high up on a branch to discover, if possible, in which direction the killer was moving. The langers ceased playing and scampered in terror to huddle in families on the treetops, while the deer and other creatures on the floor of the jungle, whose sharp ears had detected the sounds of death and the alarm of the monkeys, raced uphill and away from that valley of doom. Time passed, and the life of the forest resumed its normal course. The birds forgot the tragedy in a matter of seconds. The monkeys and the other animals took perhaps an hour to calm down, while the pujaris in the distant hamlet of Manchi would undoubtedly have forgotten the death of their clansmen. Kira in a month or two, had not another of them been killed a fortnight later, and, ten days after that, a third. These things the pujaris could not forget. A dreadful fear overshadowed them. A scourge lay upon their tiny village, a man-eater had come to stay. These people belong to a tribe that lives on the produce of the forest. They gather wild honey from giant combs built on high rocks and trees. They catch the iguana lizard which they eat or sell for the aphrodisiac properties said to exist in its tail. They pick medicinal herbs and roots and berries which are traded as medicine. And they cut and collect bamboos, grass and the pods of the tamarind fruit, according to the season of the year. All for a pittance, less than an ordinary person living in Europe or America would spend on feeding his pet dog. Their work, their very existence depends upon the forest, and into that jungle a fearful menace had now come. No man who left his miserable grass hut in the morning knew whether he would return that night. No woman or child was safe, for the second and third victims had been a young girl of nine years and a pregnant bride of fourteen. None of them did anything about it except one man, and that was my old friend Byra, the Pujari. Once before had he summoned me, in the case of the marauder of Kempikera, about which I have written elsewhere. Once again he asked me to come to the help of the people of Manchi. This time Byra arrived in person rather than convey the message through another. He walked ten miles or more from Manchi to Ayer village, and then nine miles to Denkanakota town, whence a bus brought him to Bangalore. From the story he told me it was clear that the three killings had taken place in comparatively quick succession, within a total of twenty-four days and all within a radius of four miles from Manchi in the vicinity of the track leading from Ayer to Kempikarai along the deep valley that I have elsewhere referred to as Spider Valley, because of the large spiders to be found there. These killings indicated that the perpetrator was a comparative novice, so far as man-eaters go. Either he was a young animal that had, for some reason or the other, just launched out on a career of man-eating, or he was a wounded tiger that had been almost incapacitated and was desperately hungry, or perhaps a tigress, killing merely to feed her cubs. This third alternative was extremely unlikely, as there was still a fair amount of game on the surrounding hills, while cattle were plentiful around the villages of Ayer, Gulhadi, and Batamugalam. The facts pointed more to his being a beginner. No experienced man-eater would have killed in such quick succession or almost in the same place as had this tiger. Veterans are far too cunning to do that. They follow a circuitous beat of many miles, covering a large tract of land, and slay at sudden and infrequent intervals, all of which habits combine to make them extremely difficult to shoot. The course for me to follow would be to strike quickly and bag this beast before he began to learn from experience, and become more cautious and adept. That caution would come as soon as the villagers tried to retaliate by shooting him or by some other means. He would be frightened then, or perhaps he would be wounded that would make him a wiser and far more dangerous antagonist. I knew the terrain well. For many years I had tramped the dense bamboo jungle in the deep, narrow valley flanked by the two parallel ranges of towering hills, running north and south, closely bordering the banks of the narrow stream that also flowed southwards to merge finally into the Chinar River at a place called Sapathy. The eastern range was the loftier of the two, culminating in a high peak named Guthuran, near which was a picturesque forest bungalow known as the Kodakarai Forest Lodge. Kempikarai Hamlet lay on the slopes of the other and western range, a short distance above the little stream. The locale was almost the same as in my earlier adventure, except that the marauder of Kempikarai had been a more experienced man-eater, hunting in an area west and south of the little hamlet of that name. The present animal had so far confined his activities to the north of the settlement of Manchi. For this reason, he should be a comparatively easy proposition to back. Bundling Byra and my camp kit into the Studebaker, with food to last for about a week in the form of flour for chapatis, 
bread, butter, vegetables, especially potatoes, and of course tea, coffee, and sugar, together with my little tent and bed roll. We set out for Denkanakota and Ayer. From the latter place we would have to walk to Manchi, and that would mean that Byra and I must carry the load for upwards of 10 miles. Fortunately, it would be downhill for most of the way going, but uphill coming back as far as possible. I avoid tinned foods on these excursions. I grant that they are convenient to transport, but like the villagers of India, I like my food fresh and simple. Thereby, I have contrived to avoid much indigestion and the other stomach troubles that appear to afflict half the sophisticated people of the world, Indians and Europeans alike. I put my tent on Byra's head, slung the bed roll onto my back, piled the kit bag with the flour and vegetables on his, and carried the rest of the things, including the rifles, myself. I can assure you we were well weighed down, but Byra seemed to feel no inconvenience as he strode rapidly along in front of me. The valley was hot and humid, and I was bathed in perspiration, while my companion was exposed to greater risk from a wild elephant by walking in front. I was in more danger from the tiger, as man-eaters invariably attack the last person on the trail. In both cases, heavily burdened as we were, neither of us would have been able to do much about it. But I don't think we thought about elephants or tigers, being more bent upon reaching the journey's end as quickly as possible, and ridding ourselves of our abominable loads. We arrived at last, and with a sigh of relief, I threw down the things I was carrying, just beyond the little pool of drinking water that was to figure so prominently in this adventure. The first requirement was tea, gallons of it, and I asked Byra to fill the kettle from the pool and light a fire quickly. Very soon we were pouring scalding tea down our throats, and life seemed to be rosy once more. By this time some of Byra's friends from the hamlet had gathered around us. They were all pujaris, an underfed skinny and scantily clad group, but all as tough as nails. The men wore little mooches and nothing else, the women were bare-breasted, the rest covered by saris that hung in shreds and hid nothing. The children, both boys and girls, were completely naked. There were the usual greetings, whereupon Byra launched into a prolonged account of how he had traveled to Bangalore to bring his Dorai, who had immediately come to their help. There was a murmur of amazement and, being of a practical turn of mind, I took advantage of the situation to dispatch some of the elder boys to gather firewood from the brambles growing around the pool, and one of the men to lay in a store of water in the aluminium carrier and the water bottle. These mundane but essential matters attended to, I set about munching the roasted meat, jam and buttered bread brought from home. While I asked my companions to tell me all they knew about the tiger, I acquired little information other than the bare facts that Byra had already recounted. But there was one new item. Byra had set forth for Bangalore the previous morning, in the early afternoon of the same day, as nobody would go near the pool later than 3 o'clock for fear of the man-eater. Four of the women had gone for water together. They had kept close to one another, relying on their numbers for safety. The women had finished the task, and were turning away when the eldest noticed a slight movement, under one of the bushes bordering the jungle some fifty yards away. She looked closer. Her companions, noticing her staring at something, all looked the same way. On the ground under that bush was the head of an enormous tiger. It was glaring at them hungrily, and snarling. With screams they threw down their water pots and bolted for the hamlet, less than two hundred yards away. This time the tiger did not attack and they all got back in safety. Two of those four women were among the group around me. One described the tiger's head as that big, indicating a distance of a yard between outstretched hands. The other, who was a very matter-of-fact and comely young girl, and somewhat of a wit to boot, said it was big enough to eat all four of them and me as well. Her subtle smile after this statement was perhaps a hint that, after it was all over, I would at least be in good company inside the tiger's belly. The news gladdened me and I noticed the gleam of satisfaction that sprang into Byra's eyes. Old hunter that he was, he knew that things would be easier for us now. If the tiger was there yesterday evening, as likely as not it would come again this evening. For all we knew, it might be watching us at that very moment. This fresh development made me change my mind about pitching my tent near the pool. It would not fit into the plan that now came to my mind. To make camp within the hamlet itself was a far from attractive proposition, as the Pujaris, who have many good attributes, do not count cleanliness among them. So, I got some of the men to carry my things a little beyond the village, to where a wild jackfruit tree was growing. Beneath its shade I pitched the small tent and put my belongings inside. The plan that had come to me connected the tiger with the pool, 
strange, indeed, that a situation of this nature should be twice destined to arise in waiting for a man-eater. In that earlier adventure at Kempikarai, just a few miles away but many years ago, I had waited all night long at a well for the marauder to make an attempt to kill me, but I had waited in vain. Perhaps this tiger, which was certainly not such an experienced animal, would be more obliging and I was glad I had not made the mistake of pitching my tent, that was more or less white in color, within sight of the pool. Whereas the marauder of years ago might have been tempted to attack the occupant, this recruit among man-eaters would surely be frightened away. Or so I reasoned, and Byra agreed with me. Events that night were to prove both of us quite wrong. At sunset I ate an early supper, finishing the last of the roast I had brought. This time I made no tea and drank hardly any water, for experience had taught me. That imbibing liquids does not help when a night-long vigil for a man-eater is contemplated. Nature cannot be diverted from her normal practices, and the slightest fidgeting or movement on the part of the hunter will betray his presence to the tiger when he comes. The night would be dark, for which reason I did not follow quite the same plan as I had with the marauder. That had been a moonlit night and I had deliberately advertised my presence at the well by working the squeaking pulley and pretending to draw water in order to attract the tiger. But this night would be totally dark and it would be foolish to show myself openly. He would hear and see me all right, the only trouble being that I certainly would not be able to see him, and might not be able to hear him either, till it was too late. So, I decided to modify the scheme a little by sitting with my back against a babel tree, some twenty feet from the water and facing the jungle. I would sit quite still and with no movement whatever. The man-eater could hardly attack from the rear. He would have to come from in front or from either side and sitting motionless would not only help me to hear him, but it would puzzle him also. He might not notice me at all, or if he did, as a novice he would be perplexed at my immobility and decide to investigate. I hoped he would make some sound in the process. When Byra heard my plan, he told me that it was a very stupid one. The tiger might attack without making any preliminary sound. He might come from behind. I would hear nothing and see nothing in that darkness, but the man-eater would certainly see me, while he would never see me again. For that matter, the tiger might not come this way at all. Why should he be snooping around a pool of water at dead of night? The beast knew very well that people drew water from it, but during the hours of daylight and not at night. While he was speaking, Byra looked at me significantly, and the meaning of his glance became quite apparent. He was trying to put me off. I know all that, I interrupted testily, but it's the only way. The old fellow was bent upon complicating the situation. I never meant that you should not sit for the tiger, he said aggressively. What I meant was that you should be beside me. We should await his return together, idiot, I interrupted. Being as rude as I could, you have not the brains of a flea. In what way will your presence lessen the darkness? Keep out of this and let me try the plan I have in mind, at least for tonight. Tomorrow, you may tell me a better one, if you can think of one. If you are here to listen, he concluded pointedly. And so, an hour before sunset, I took up my position near the little pool, my back to the babel tree and facing the jungle, the small stream beyond and the pathway along which we had come that morning. Inwardly, I hoped that the tiger would arrive early and see me and that in turn he would show himself as he had to the four girls, so that the episode might be closed before darkness fell. Unfortunately, the man-eater did not oblige. The pujaris in the hamlet drew great clumps of thorns, which they had cut earlier, around the low entrances to their wattle huts, stepped gingerly between them and slipped inside. I could hear the thatched doors of the huts being barricaded from within with large stones, gathered from the stream for the purpose. These people believed in self-help, and it was evident they did not have much confidence in my ability to save them from the killer that now threatened their lives. The sun had sunk behind the range of hills to the west, outlining their heights against a background of blue, which turned to pink and then to orange. As I was facing northeast, I could just catch brief glimpses of the beauties of this sunset. The orange deepened to blood red, and then to crimson, green and yellow and violet and purple. An instant later it was quite dark. While I had been watching the sunset abstractly, I had been listening to the sounds of the jungle which at all times are pleasant music to my ears, particularly at the close of the day and again at dawn. Two families of langur monkeys, one on each of the slopes of the opposing ranges of hills, called to each other across the narrow, deep valley. Whoomp, whoomp, cried the males of one batch as they leapt from branch to branch, and back came the joyous notes from the other group on the hill slopes across the stream. Whoomp, whoomp, and cheek cheek from the females and young. 
Then the sounds of pleasure suddenly turned to those of fear and danger as the monkey watchman of the more distant clan issued his staccato barking alarm cry. Horror. Horror. Which he continued to repeat at short intervals. The group nearer to me and on the same side of the valley fell silent, while their watchman in turn took up the note of warning, answering the more distant calls of his colleague. Horror. Horror. The two monkey sentinels kept answering one another and my nerves tingled pleasantly in expectation. To one accustomed to such sounds there was a wealth of difference in the timbre of the calls. The voice of the distant watchman was filled with great fear and apprehension, and it was evident that he could see the source of danger. The watchman on this side of the valley, although sounding the alarm also, was merely doing his duty to alert his tribe. His notes were flat and matter-of-fact. This could be detected by the fact that he called each time immediately after the other watchman, like an echo. The calls of the two monkeys were becoming less frequent when a jungle cock, somewhere on the stream, screamed suddenly in fright, cuck, tuck, tuck, the hen with him, hearing the cries of fright made by her mate, flew quickly away crying, keek, 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 silence and a great stillness enveloped the jungle. Then a peacock gave sign of nervousness, quonk, 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 his metallic notes broke the stillness and a moment later I could hear the distant heavy flapping of wings as he launched his weighty body into the air to reach a place of greater safety. I knew the tiger was afoot. He had descended the opposite range of hills and been discovered by the distant Langer watchman. He had crossed the stream and disturbed the jungle fowls and the peacock. He was now coming straight towards the pool and the spot where I was seated. It was growing darker with the passing of each minute. Would the keen eyes of the nearer Langer watchman detect him? Although the monkey had the advantage of elevation, he was comparatively far away, and no tiger, not even a beginner among man-eaters, will betray his presence unnecessarily. My doubt was settled the next instant when the watchman on the hillside to my left broke forth hysterically. Horror. Horror. His cries were quick now, and independent of his distant colleague, who was still calling, but at long intervals. The note of fear was there this time, of danger and sudden death. He had seen the man-eater, and it was much closer to me than I had thought. But of the tiger itself I could see or hear nothing. It was growing darker all the time. The bushes at the edge of the jungle before me had lost their individual outlines. They appeared as grey masses against a background of deep chocolate, turning rapidly black. A frightened hush fell over the forest, permeating it, enveloping it. The further Langer watchman had stopped calling altogether, and the nearer one barked only intermittently. He could see the tiger no longer and, having fulfilled his duty by alarming his tribe, was wondering what next to do about it. The summits of the ranges of hills to my right and left showed themselves as ragged lines of intense blackness against a background of lesser darkness, studded by stars, flashing, and blazing in a distant glory all their own. I concentrated upon one of them. It seemed to change its colors constantly, like a heavenly gem. While staring into the blackness before me I glanced alternatively from right to left. I slowed my breathing, even tried to hold my breath altogether in an effort to hear the very faintest of sounds. But I saw and heard nothing. Then, with nerve-shattering abruptness, a sandbar belled in the thickets just the other side of the pool. The brambles crackled to his departure as he crashed his way through. The sounds of his running were lost in a few seconds, but he continued to call with alarm as he rattled over the pebbles in the stream and scrambled up the slopes of the opposing range of hills. Came his cries as they grew fainter with the ever-increasing distance. Grateful, indeed, was I for the warnings of my jungle friends, for they told me as unmistakably as if I had seen him with my own eyes, that the tiger was within a few yards of where I was sitting. The questions were, had he seen me? What he see me? I know the value of stillness in the jungle, and so I sat absolutely motionless, hardly daring to breathe. That was my only hope of escaping the tiger's immediate attention. The seconds ticked interminably by. They appeared to pass into minutes and then into hours, though I knew that they were only seconds. Then I heard a gentle rustle to my right, the faintest of sounds, as of a leaf being turned over, and it came from a direction in line with the pool. Not a breath of air passed which could have caused that dry leaf to be moved and I knew that the author of the sound was moving through the undergrowth, hidden from my sight, and passing the pool at that moment, and that in a few moments more he would have passed behind me. Holding my breath I listened intently, but I heard no further sound. Every instinct warned me that the tiger had now passed and was somewhere behind the bushes on the other side of the tree against which I was leaning. 
I was filled with an urge to turn around and face the danger, but I knew that if I did so I would certainly make some faint noise. However slight it might be, the tiger would hear it and, in all probability, would turn to investigate. So, I overcame the urge, but turned my head around to see if the beast was creeping upon me from the rear. All I could see was the trunk of the tree only a few inches away, and beyond that darkness. I do not know for how long I endured this suspense, but suddenly the silence was shattered by the high-pitched fear-laden yelping bark of a village dog in the Pujari hamlet so close behind me. The tension was relieved for the moment and I breathed more easily. Two things were evident to me now. The tiger had passed the well without detecting my presence and had gone towards the wattle huts, obviously in search of human prey. Secondly, and beyond any doubt, it was the man-eater, as no ordinary tiger would deliberately wander near human habitation. At that moment a perfectly silly notion entered my head. I reasoned that I could achieve no useful purpose by remaining where I was. Assuming that the man-eater did not succeed in finding a human victim, there was little chance that he would retrace his steps and pass the pool again. He might wander away in any direction. While if he did return, he would come upon me from the rear and this time he might not fail to detect my presence. I cannot tell you, however, why I did not think of doing the most obvious thing, just sit where I was, but facing the hamlet. Instead, I made up my mind to go towards the hamlet myself, shine my torch when I came close enough, and pick up the glare of the tiger's eyes in its beam. That should afford me an easy shot. This was a silly thing to do. Had I remained where I was, the tiger might have returned to drink at the pool, while I would have been in a fair position, behind the stem of the babel tree, for an easy shot. Instead, I got stealthily to my feet, and in a half-crouching position, started advancing towards the hamlet, which was hardly 200 yards away. Within a few steps I realized my foolishness, for although there was a well-defined pathway leading from the huts to the pool, in the intense darkness I could not see it and began stumbling among the bushes, making enough noise to scare away the man-eater or urge him to attack. I then thought of going back to the friendly babble, but again decided to advance, this time with the full knowledge that the man-eater might be five yards away, behind any bush, and I would not be able to see it. The hysterical barking of the cur was taken up by others of its kind, and by now some half-dozen village dogs were yowling their heads off in a perfect frenzy, making enough noise to unnerve the boldest of man-eaters. It was extremely doubtful that the tiger would pursue his original intentions in the face of this din. He would either slink off or turn back, and if he did turn back, he would run into me, face to face, at any moment. With this thought in mind, I made the second mistake of the evening. I switched on my torch, far too soon, as it turned out. As the bright beam cut through the darkness, the tiger, of which I did not catch a glimpse, true to the cowardly code of most man-eaters, roared shatteringly from somewhere in front. And I could hear him crashing into the dry scrub beyond. There was no point in further caution. My quarry had fled and I followed the torch beam dejectedly towards the Pujari's waddle huts, while cursing myself repeatedly for the idiot I had been. Upon reaching the hamlet, I called softly to Byra, who emerged from one of the huts. He had been awake and had listened to the alarm cries of the langurs at sunset, followed by those other sounds. The barking of the dogs had mystified him till the tiger had roared. Only then had he realized that the man-eater was in the village itself. He was even more surprised at finding me there also. Quickly I related what had happened, and was not comforted with Byra's brief comment, heavy with sarcasm. Did the door I think he was following a rabbit? Perhaps the years have affected his wisdom. It was now just after 8 o'clock, and with nothing better to do, I walked to my tent, which you will remember I had pitched under the jackfruit tree beyond the village, lit the small hurricane lantern hanging from the central pole, and made myself a pot of tea. That done, I closed and fastened the flap of the tent, spread my bedding on the ground, not having burdened myself with the weight of a camp cot, extinguished the lantern because I do not like sleeping with a light burning, and was soon fast asleep. Something awakened me with a start. In the jungle, one does not wake as city folk usually do, from the snug warmth of a comfortable bed, to yawn and stretch in luxury and maybe spend another five minutes, contemplating with dismay the tasks that have to be performed. The forest teaches its inhabitants to sleep alert. When they awaken, they are keyed to instant action, for a second's delay may be their last. When I opened my eyes, the vague feeling of danger that filled my mind synchronized with my groping hand, and outstretched fingers as they fumbled for the rifle I had placed loaded on the ground beside me. 
its comforting hardness brought assurance as I sat up to discover what had awakened me with that urgent, oppressive sense of peril. For a second I could hear nothing, and then came the faintest of scratching sounds, which stopped and started again after a moment or two, and then once more. The side of the tent moved slightly and something entered from underneath, something that groped about here and there with a sinister purpose. Was it a snake? That something encountered the edge of my bedding. As it lay on the ground to my left barely a foot away, became entangled with it, and pulled away sharply, wrenching canvas and ground sheet with a sharp, tearing noise. The man-eater was outside. He had sensed the presence of a human being within the tent, but fortunately, with no knowledge of its flimsy structure, had tried to feel with his paw under the canvas and along the ground in the hope of reaching his prey, whom he would drag out before the victim was aware of what was happening. A neat little plan indeed, the only fault being that the victim was myself. Fortunate that a premonition of terrible danger had awakened me in time. I quickly pulled the rifle across my body as I lay on the ground, pointing the muzzle towards where I knew the tiger must be and slid my right hand towards the trigger. Remember, it was pitch dark in the tent when this happened. Then I did not know exactly where, and in what position the tiger was standing outside. I waited for the next movement and it came again, as the groping paw wrenched once more at the bedroll. Then I pressed the trigger. There was a deafening explosion and I scrambled to my feet, working the under lever of the .405 Winchester, to fire two more shots blindly through the canvas side of my tent. There was no sound from the tiger. Was it dead? Even so, it should have uttered a last gasp or gurgle. Was it wounded? Then surely it would have roared with pain. Had it got away? I must have missed. That could be the only explanation for the unaccountable silence. Like a fool I had once again made an inexcusable mistake. My torch was clamped to the rifle. Why had I not switched it on for a brief moment before firing? A second or two of torchlight would have sufficed to indicate the direction from which the groping paw was coming and where the tiger was standing outside the tent. Instead, I had pressed the trigger blindly in total darkness, three times, moreover hoping to hit an animal whose whereabouts I did not know. With torch alight, I hastily opened the tapes closing the entrance to the tent and stepped forth cautiously, to direct the torch beam in every direction. As I had already guessed, the man-eater had escaped, nor was there the slightest sound to indicate in which direction he had fled. My three shots had awakened the Pujaris in Manchi Hamlet. I could hear the voices of Byra and some others calling anxiously, inquiring if all was well, knowing that if I did not go to them soon, the poor fellows would brave the darkness and come to find out what had happened. I walked the short distance to the huts by torchlight and told a huddled, frightened group of little jungle men just what had taken place. They insisted in coming back with me right away to see the three bullet holes in the canvas of my tent for themselves and the ragged edges in my bedding made by the tiger's claws. They called loudly upon God in thanks for protecting me. Then I had to leave them back at the hamlet, where Byra implored me to share the hut in which he slept for the rest of the night, and not risk going back to my tent. But this invitation I declined and marched back once again, and lay down to continue a much disturbed sleep, this time with the hurricane lantern brightly burning. Sheer disgust with myself and things in general, caused me to awaken long after sunrise. Voices outside greeted me, and opening the tent flap I found all the pujaris from the hamlet squatting around in a semicircle. The reason for their visit was a simple one. My foolish actions of the previous evening and night, and the misses I had made with the three shots I had fired, was to be explained in just two words, both of them very simple, black magic. Someone had cast a spell upon me and my rifle, so that I and the weapon did not act in coordination. Who had done it? Why? When? How? The spell would have to be removed if I hoped to kill the man-eater. Superstition of this sort is rife amongst the simple people of the Indian forests, and large numbers of townsfolk as well. I knew that no amount of reasoning, persuasion or argument would make the Pujaris think otherwise. If I ignored their belief, they would just cease cooperating with me, and then blame my failure on the spell that had been cast on me and my weapon. The shortest and easiest way was to agree. I said, yes, some misbegotten son of a, has cast a spell without doubt. Will you please remove it, if you can? In turn, the eldest among them replied, yes, but it will cost five rupees to do this, going on to explain that this sum covered the cost of a fowl that had to be sacrificed, and various other articles, together with the fee for performing the puja. I agreed again, paid the five rupees, and went inside the tent to snatch another hour of sleep. 
but disgust with myself prevented me from sleeping and I fell to thinking about the man-eater. The raucous screeching of an unfortunate chicken having its throat cut, followed by the acrid smell of smoke and incense, announced that puja was being performed. In due course, Byra called me. Dorai, Dorai, wake up and come out. The spell is broken. Let us search for the tiger now. We will surely find him, and this time he will fall to your rifle with a single shot, for the weapon will obey your command. The puja was not quite complete, however. The Greybeard, who was also the sorcerer of the hamlet, asked for my rifle. Laying it on the ground he made various marks in red and white, on both sides of the stock. The entrails of the chicken were next looped into a circle, and passed up and down the length of the barrel half a dozen times, and muttered mantras and some more incense smoke. Finally, he scattered the fire in four directions, calling loudly to the tiger to come forth and be shot. The sun was high in the sky by the time all this was over. Lyra and a Pujari lad of about 20 years of age, who turned out to be the grandson of the old man who had conducted the puja, then invited me to accompany them into the forest in search of the man-eater. As everybody knows, to look for a tiger in any jungle, especially a man-eater, by walking about in broad daylight is not only hopeless but foolish and a waste of time. My regard for Byra's jungle craft was boundless, but that a hunter of his experience could lend himself to this sort of foolishness surprised me. My looks must have shown my disapproval, but Byra and the lad together urged me to waste no further time in idle talk. Evidently, they had implicit faith in their sorcerer. We started, Byra leading, then me and next the boy, but as soon as we were out of sight of the hamlet, I insisted on altering this marching order and exchanged places with Mafu, for that was the lad's name. If the man-eater did see us, regardless of all the hocus-pocus that had just been performed, the chances were that like all man-eaters, this one would decide to attack the last individual in the line of march, and the unarmed youngster would not have a chance. We walked downhill to the stream bed, where we cast around in the loose, dry sand for recent tracks. Difficult as it always is, in such terrain to differentiate between fresh and old spores, the two Pujaris were not long in finding the tiger's tracks, where he had approached the pool with me sitting near it the previous night. A little later, and nearly a furlong away, they found his trail again, this time leading away from the village. Whether this was the spore left by the tiger when my light near the hamlet had alarmed him, or later on after I had fired my three shots through the tent, was settled by the fact that the scooping out of the grains of sand at the toe portions of the tracks, and the marks of all four feet separately on the ground, showed that our quarry was moving very fast when he made them with no attempt at concealment or caution. Evidently, he was hurrying away after being badly frightened, and this appeared to indicate we were following the trail left by the man-eater. After I had fired those foolish shots, the absence of blood anywhere confirmed that he was uninjured. We had not gone far when the trail veered abruptly to the right and led straight up the hillside on the eastern bank of the stream. I remembered that this was the direction from which the monkey watchman of the first batch of langers had voiced his alarm the evening before when the tiger was descending the hill. Now the tiger had returned the same way. Very probably his lair was in a cave somewhere higher up that hill, or perhaps some distance further away, on the slopes of the Guthrian mountain. With this discovery came difficulties. The ground became hard and stony once we had traversed the low-lying belt of bamboos. Clumps of spear grass grew in between rocks, and small boulders and all signs of pug marks vanished entirely. The two Pujaris, experts though they were in woodcraft, were soon at a complete loss. They moved around in small circles, trying to pick up the trail. At times Byra, and then his young companion, would come upon a broken stem of grass or an overturned stone. That showed the way the tiger had gone. But this was not for long and very soon they were forced to a halt. Beyond knowing that the tiger had gone up the hill, we had no further indication of his whereabouts. We discussed the matter in whispers, and decided to climb the hill ourselves in the vague hope of coming upon a cave of some sort, in which the man-eater might be hiding. To proceed in single file meant covering only a single line of advance, so we decided to fan out slightly in order to search a wider area. Byra went about a hundred yards to my right but remained within sight, while Muthu moved off about the same distance to my left. Then the three of us started to advance cautiously. The ground became stonier and the boulders increased in size and number, but we came across no signs of a lair. The hillock we were climbing might have been about 500 feet high, but in due course we reached the top and were able to look down the other side. Here the ground dropped sharply to a lush valley, thickly covered with bamboo, before it started to climb the next foothill. 
Above that hill rose the peak of the Guthrian Mountain. At a signal from me, and maintaining the same distance apart, the three of us began the steep descent. On this side the hillock was more fertile. There were fewer rocks and boulders, larger and taller clumps of grass, and even bushes and stunted trees that increased in number, till we had reached the region of bamboos, where we found ourselves in a green twillet valley beneath the towering fronds. Now we could no longer see each other, and very soon I felt that my companions, unarmed as they were, had exposed themselves to terrible risk, for I could not help them, should the tiger decide to attack. The bamboos and heavy jungle afforded ample cover and even the keen eyes of the two aborigines could not possibly penetrate the green wall that enveloped the three of us. It was as if this thought gave rise to action, for just then I heard a shrill scream of terror from the Pujari boy. who was about a hundred yards to my left. This was followed by short, sharp woofs. As the tiger charged him, the roars ended abruptly when Byra, to my right, gave voice to a volley of shouts. Knowing he was doing this in an attempt to frighten off the attacker, I added my yells to his, as I turned and crashed towards the spot from which the scream and the roars had come. Short as the distance was, Byra had caught up with me before we found the lad. He was lying on his face, just beyond a pile of boulders and long grass. The back of his skull crushed in, while deep fang marks at the base of the neck and over the right shoulder showed where the tiger had first bitten him before smashing his skull with a stroke of the paw. Possibly the man-eater had been seized by a mixture of fear and rage at hearing our shouts, intended, as I have told you, to save the boy's life. But in this instance, they had sealed his fate, for the tiger had killed him. The flattened grass on the opposite side of the pile of boulders showed where the man-eater had been hiding, waiting till the lad had passed before pouncing upon him from behind. We turned the young Pujari over and were confronted by a ghastly spectacle. The force of the blow upon the back of his head had caused the eyeballs to protrude, while the boy had bitten through his own tongue, so that the end hung loosely from his mouth, held by a shred of flesh. Blood seeped into the sand where it was forming a little pool. Shaken and feeling sick, I turned to my companion. His jet-black face had turned to an ashen hue, and his features worked violently with emotion. But not a word did he say, nor did I. What was there to say? We and most certainly I could only blame ourselves for our carelessness, and for exposing this unarmed youth to the fiendish cunning of the tiger. It was just eleven o'clock, and the sun beat mercilessly down upon the scene. It took some minutes to recover from the shock. Then I said, you were so sure that we would kill the tiger after that silly puja. Instead, he has slain one of us. Byra did not answer at once. When he spoke, there was resentment in his tone. The sorcerer should have sacrificed a cock. Instead, he slew a hen, for the hen cost him a rupee less. But it has cost his, grants and his life. I was scarcely listening. An idea had flashed into my mind. I walked through the long grass to the boulders, stepped on one, and looked back at the body barely 10 yards. The distance was almost too close. There were only four boulders lying haphazardly together, and the largest of them, the one on which I stood was about three feet high. The others were much smaller. The idea then became a definite plan. Since there were already some stones on the spot, would the tiger notice if a few more were added? Perhaps not, provided the extra stones were so placed as not to give rise to undue suspicion. I turned to Byra and said, The night will be dark and this will tempt the devil we are after, to return to his kill early, provided we leave the body where it is. For he is hungry, remember. He was hungry last night. That was why he went so boldly to the huts at Manchi. And he has not eaten since then. Tonight, he will be very hungry indeed. So, we will bring some more boulders to add to these four and make a hide in which I will sit. At this close range, when my torchlight falls upon him, I cannot miss. Dorai, you're completely mad, commented the old hunter. As soon as he sees the hide, he'll suspect something. Perhaps he may go away. Maybe not. If he should spring over the boulders, he will be on top of you, before you know where you are. Besides, he continued, it's our duty to return to Manchi, and tell that rascally grandfather what has happened to the poor boy. Then the men from the village will come and bear his body away, and burn it tonight. Thus, his soul will gain peace. If we leave his remains here to be eaten by the tiger and not burn them, the soul will wander in these jungles and torment us for failing to do our duty. The tiger will not eat them. I cut in sharply, for I will be among the boulders to prevent him. That I promise you. Is this not a good chance to be avenged upon this devil? If I succeed in slaying him tonight, will I not save many lives, perhaps your own among them? 
as a hunter yourself, don't you agree? It would be foolish for us to lose such a golden opportunity. Byra did not reply. I could feel him weakening. Finally, he looked at me and there was complete innocence in his expression. We've searched everywhere and cannot find the body, Dorai. Let's go back now and inform the others. Tomorrow morning, we will search again. Tonight, you will sit at the side of some jungle path to await the tiger, should he pass by, while I will perch like a monkey on a tree, out of sight but not out of hearing, in case you should need my help. Thus, Byra settled the issue with his conscience and we got to work in right earnest. In order not to arouse the tiger's suspicion, we moved quite 200 yards away to another area strewn with boulders, big and small. Together we carried half a dozen of the larger ones, one at a time, and placed them in a rough circle with the four boulders that were already there. On this foundation we placed smaller stones, so that in time we had built a circular wall maybe three feet high. I realized it would not do to make this wall any higher for the additional safety, thus gain would be of no avail, should the tiger become suspicious, on seeing a construction before him that had not been there on his last visit. Next, into crevices between the stones, we stuck handfuls of the tough grass, which we tore from tufts and clumps growing some distance away. All this took a long time and was strenuous work, for you must realize the sun beat down on us mercilessly, and the stones and the grass had to be brought from a distance to avoid creating suspicion. When we left Manchi that morning, boosted by the sorcerer's confidence that we would kill the tiger, I had brought only my rifle and no torch or water bottle. It would be dangerous to send Byra back alone to fetch these things. Either we would both have to go back, or I could go myself and leave the Pujari up a tree. And if I did that there was always the chance that the tiger might return. During my absence and carry away the cadaver of the unfortunate boy, to some more remote spot where it would be difficult for us to find it again. After considering all these factors and whispers, we decided that we had no choice but to take up our positions straight away. I within the small three-foot fort we had constructed and Byra on some tree within hearing distance, and remain in our places till next morning, in the hope that the man-eater would remember his human victim and come back for a meal. We could only hope that the tiger had not been in hiding within hearing distance all this while, for then our movements during the past three hours would undoubtedly have alarmed him, and he would have moved off long ago, not to return. Our only chance of success lay in the hope that he might have gone higher up the hill in search of water and had not heard us. It was most unlikely that he had returned to the stream in the valley for, as I have told you, it was quite dry at this time of the year. We cast around in a wide circle for a suitable tree for Byra, and came upon one about half a furlong away, slightly lower down the hill from the spot where the boy had been killed. This was a fairly large tamarind and offered ample scope for the old Pujari to shelter in comfortably, till I called him next morning. It was 2.15 in the afternoon, perhaps the hottest time of day, when Byra climbed the tamarind after earnestly advising me to be careful and not fall asleep at any cost. Leaving him there, I returned to my little fort, scrambled over the scorching stones we had placed there to form the wall, and tried to settle down inside. I at once encountered the first difficulty. The ground was so hot that I could not sit on it, but had to remain crouched on my haunches. Apart from being a painful and uncomfortable posture, the wall was not high enough for it. My head showed above the top and would be easily seen from outside, so I had to sit with head bowed to try to conceal myself. It did not take me long to realize that such a position was absurd and dangerous, for I would not be able to see the tiger should he creep upon me. I got out of the hide then, walked some distance away, and plucked several handfuls of tough grass stems, which I stuck very closely together into the puggery of my Gurkha hat. This took a little time, but I was satisfied with the task eventually. When seen from a distance, there was no hat to be seen. Only another clump of grass. Donning the hat, I returned within my fort of stones, crouched once more on my haunches and attempted to remain motionless. I was just able to look over the rim of the rocks in a half circle, before and to both sides of me, and by turning my head ever so slowly to right and left, I could even see behind. This movement would not be very noticeable, I felt, as the whole clump of grass on my hat would turn with it and might be mistaken by the tiger for the effect of the hot breeze that was blowing from the valley and the stream bed towards the hilltops and was rippling the bowed heads of the dried grass in waves from time to time. I soon found that I could not remain still in that crouching posture for very long. My ankles became painful and the calves of my legs became numb. 
I had to move this way and that, slowly and a little at a time, till after 4 o'clock, when the earth cooled sufficiently to allow me to sit down. Up to this time the surroundings had been abnormally silent. Not an animal or bird had indicated its presence by sight or sound. All creation, and no doubt the tiger, too was sheltering from the devastating heat. Only twice had I seen movement. Firstly when a giant iguana lizard attempted to cross, caught sight of Mufu's body on the ground, turned abruptly and scrambled away. And later, when a small python, hanging unnoticed head downwards from a low tree, had dropped upon a passing ground squirrel to crush it to death. I had seen the squirrel, but had not noticed the snake till I saw the python's coils squirming in the grass and heard the squeaks of the victim being crushed to death. There was a marked cooling of the air by 5 o'clock and this reminded me that I had drunk no water since morning. There was not a drop to drink anyhow, and worst of all, I would have to remain thirsty till I returned to Manchi the following morning. A truly formidable thought. A partridge on the hillside to my left broke the long silence at last. Keecock cock. Keecock cock. Keecock cock. He called in challenge and within minutes came the acceptance to a fight from another male bird slightly higher up the hill. Keecock cock. cock. Keecock cock. The two partridges challenged each other frequently as they drew closer together, hastening to the fray, till finally they met. Then, with hysterical cries of cock, 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 the duel started in earnest. Unfortunately, I could not see the birds but could picture the battle in my imagination, for the ten minutes or so that it lasted, before one of the contestants gave way to the superior prowess and stamina of his adversary. He flew helter-skelter from the scene of battle. I was just able to glimpse his brown form sailing precipitately downhill to safety, while the other bird remained to voice the victory cry Kikokok. 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 Once again, the battle of the partridges had served to while away the time. It was now 5.40 p.m. and the calls of jungle cocks from the stream bed in the valley rose to announce the advent of Aventide. They crowed from down below, to be answered by other cocks on the hillsides in all directions. Occasionally a pea fowl voiced its meowing cry, <coughs> while bull bulls in hundreds <coughs> on bushes and thickets joined in the general symphony of calls that remain indelible in the memory of all that have known these beautiful jungles. But it would not do for me to pay too much heed to these sounds, much as I enjoyed hearing them. I would have to remain keenly alert from now onwards, for with nightfall drawing near, the man-eater would remember his victim and might decide to return at any moment. At this time the two tribes of Langer monkeys, one of them on the hilltop above me and the other somewhere on the adjacent hill across the stream, started their eventide gambols, frolicking among themselves and calling boldly to each other across the intervening valley. Whoomp, whoomp. They screamed as they leaped from branch to branch. I could not see them from where I was sitting, but could hear the bang and thud of their bodies as they landed heavily among the branches of the trees. I was grateful for the presence of the Langer monkeys. I knew that each tribe would have its own watchman, sitting alert on a treetop, serious, silent and intently scanning the ground below for movement and danger. The sun set behind the range of hills at my back, and the shades of evening spread rapidly around me. The grasses and bushes and boulders that had been so clear all this while, now became hazy and blurred. Distances lost their perspective. In a few moments there was no background to be seen at all, just the few indistinct bushes that grew in my immediate vicinity. All else was a dark gray void, rapidly turning to chocolate and then to blackness. Mufu's body, only ten yards away, lost its shape and became merely a darker heap upon the rapidly darkening ground. There was a whirring flutter of movement behind my head that startled me, accompanied by high-pitched, creaking squeaks. The long-eared bat, intent on its search for insects, had thought there might be a few in the clump of grass adorning my hat and had come to investigate. Softly a nightjar fluttered onto one of the stones forming my rampart. It was so close that by stretching out my hand I could have caught it, and I was pleased with myself at having sat so still, for I had even deceived this bird into not noticing my presence. The night jar snuggled low on the hot rock, puffed out its throat with air, and voiced its usual cry. Chuck, 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 chucku. Then it noticed poor Mufu. Suddenly it took fright, fluttered both its wings like a giant moth, and sailed into the air and out of sight. A little later I could hear it again, this time from far away, where the bird thought it was quite safe, voicing its jerky call. Now I could no longer see the bushes, the grasses, the stones, nor even poor Mufu. 
A curtain of blackness closed over me with the falling of night. The stars that to a certain extent illumined the darkness in a jungle were few this night as I raised my eyes heavenwards in search of them. The steely blue black of the usual night sky was covered by a ruffled blanket of small, broken, cirrocumuli clouds resembling the ringlets of wool on a sheepskin. They stretched between the two ranges of hills and all but hid the stars from sight. It was a perfect night for the man-eater to discover my presence and add me to his menu without my ever being aware of his nearness. To see him in such darkness was impossible, and I was entirely at his mercy. Suddenly I became very frightened and began to shiver. Why had I been so foolhardy as to place myself in this predicament? By not listening to the old Pujari's experienced advice. I felt like shouting to Byra. I felt like getting up and dashing away from this horrid place, to the faraway tamarind tree in which I knew my friend was sheltering. A feeling of being closed in, of suffocation, of claustrophobia, gripped me. Panic all but overwhelmed me, and the sweat of nervous terror streamed down my face. In the distance, a horned owl hooted dismally. At that moment the calm of the night was shattered by the dying scream of a sambar stag. From the stream bed down in the valley, it shrieked in its agony. Then there was silence. I knew the animal being done to death at that moment was a stag for a doe would have uttered a cry of far higher pitch, while the shriek of a spotted deer would have been quite different. Three possible foes could be killing that stag, a pack of wild dogs, a panther or a tiger. I decided against the dogs, a pack would have raised its hunting calls and I would have heard them long ago. Besides, these dogs do not hunt on dark nights, so the slayer was either a large panther of the tendu variety or a tiger. Nothing else could be killing an animal as big as a sambar stag. Even a tendu would have all its work cut out to bring down a victim of that size. Very likely the killer was a tiger after all. But was it the man-eater who was reputed to eat only human flesh? Or was it some ordinary wandering tiger who happened to be in the vicinity too? I knew that the man-eater could not subsist on human flesh alone. His kills were too few and far between. He must be devouring animals as well. And I remembered he was very hungry that night, not having eaten for some time. Very likely it was he who had attacked the stag after all. Perhaps he had been returning for Mufu and had come upon the deer by chance. The sambar was dead now and all sounds had ceased. The tiger would spend the rest of the night feeding on this new victim and would not come near the body of the Pujari lad. My vigil would have been in vain. The thought was very mortifying indeed. Mixed feelings of relief from immediate danger and sheer disgust with myself at my cowardice set in when I realized that only a few moments earlier I had been trembling, scared out of my wits at nothing, but the darkness and the thought of the man-eater's proximity. I knew that the old Pujari, too, must have heard the Sambar's death scream. Like me, he would wonder if the killer was the man-eater or some other animal. I wondered what conclusion he had reached. The slaying of the Sambar had brought to an end the nervous tension under which I had been laboring. I was quite calm now as I wondered over and over again whether the man-eater would return or not. For the next half hour or so the forest was hushed and strangely silent. It was as if its denizens were aware that danger lurked by the stream bed, and that sudden and violent death awaited any of them who betrayed his presence. I glanced at my watch. It was not yet 10 o'clock. I had many hours of tiring vigil before me. After that the jungle gradually came to life again. I could hear the stealthy nibbling of grass by a barking deer a few yards to my right. Down below, on the banks of the stream, an elephant was breaking bamboos. As the heated air from the valley started to rise, the colder air from the hilltops rushed down to take its place. This caused fitful gusts of breeze to blow and carried to the munching barking deer. The smell of Mufu's body that was now beginning to make itself felt. There was a sudden noise as the little animal dashed away for a few yards. Then it came to a halt to voice its barking alarm cry. The barks came in intervals of a few minutes. It seemed incredible that such a small animal could make such a loud noise. I knew that the call of a barking deer can be heard for over a mile on a still night. Shortly afterwards the elephant in the valley, in his hunt for fresh bamboo shoots, moved upstream. This brought him to the remains of the stag that had been killed a short while earlier. Probably the killer, panther or tiger, was still there, feeding on his prey. Whatever it was, the elephant became excited and began to trumpet repeatedly. The brassy scream of each note disturbing the silence of the forest. And then I heard it clearly, the roars of an angry tiger coming from the same direction. 
the elephant screamed again and again, and the tiger roared its defiance in between, answer for answer. I could imagine the scene. The tiger had been feeding, or perhaps just sleeping by the sambar's remains, when the elephant had blundered upon him. Would the encounter develop into a fight, or would one or other of the animals lose its nerve and retreat? The screams of the elephant began to change in timbre. The high-pitched note of fear gave place to the longer, slightly lower note of anger. I could make out that the animal was a bull. He resented the tiger's presence amongst the bamboos, which he no doubt regarded as his own property and was rapidly losing his temper. What would the tiger do? The matter was not left in doubt for long. He suddenly lost his nerve and decided to give way to the irate elephant, even if it meant abandoning his kill. There was sudden silence when the tiger beat a retreat, while the bull elephant, finding his bluster had succeeded in driving away the foe, slowly regained his composure and ceased to trumpet. Silence once again descended upon the forest. The fleecy clouds that had been hiding the stars since sunset had disappeared about an hour before, and I could now see the dark form that was Mufu and the nearer bushes and grasses reasonably clearly in the light of the stars. Now at least I might be able to see the man-eater should he decide to return to Mufu's body. This caused me to wonder again whether the tiger that had just had that altercation with the elephant was the man-eater or not. His display of cowardice tended to offer an affirmative answer. My thoughts were disturbed at that instant by a growl. I heard it only once and so I could not quite locate the sound or where it had come from, but it was an unmistakable growl. I fancied it had come from somewhere behind me and lower down the hillside, but I was not quite sure. As quietly as possible, I turned my body a few inches to the left so as to be able to observe whether anything was approaching from that direction but I could still see the smudge that was Mufu by looking to my right. And then I heard it again, another growl, louder and closer this time. There was now no doubt whatever, the tiger was coming up the hill, he was coming in my direction. I could not help smiling to myself as I thought of the great service that the elephant had done me in driving the tiger from his kill. The angry tiger had now been forced to remember that he had made another kill, one of those tasty human beings, earlier that afternoon and higher up the hill. So, he was returning to it, voicing his anger all the while, against the elephant that had disturbed him. My luck had been stupendous. Not only was the tiger advertising his presence, which was much in my favor on a dark night, but the bad temper he was displaying, and his smoldering resentment against the elephant, would prevent him from being too cautious when he eventually reached poor Mufu. After all, perhaps he would not discover my presence. I was elated at the thought. Twice more the tiger growled. Then I dimly saw a long, dark, ill-defined shape to my left and a little below me. It seemed to move. It disappeared completely. Then it appeared again, this time much closer. It was certainly moving towards me. The tiger growled again. Apparently, he was still thinking of the elephant and could not get him out of mind. The throaty, rasping note came from the long, moving object that was rapidly approaching me. The dark shadow disappeared behind an intervening bush. A few seconds later the slinking shape moved dimly from left to right and came to a halt over Mufu, just ten yards away. It had not even glanced at the little stone fort that Byra and I had so painstakingly constructed. The tiger was in such a vile temper that he voiced a series of loud growls when he bit savagely into the Pujari lad's dead body and began to worry the carcass. His recent undignified retreat before the bull elephant, and the fact that he had had to abandon his sambar kill, was annoying him intensely. He felt he had to vent his spleen on something. Only now did I realize how difficult was the task that lay before me. I had to kill the tiger with my first shot, or at least cripple it effectively so that it would not turn upon me. My quarry was a mere ten yards away, but I could just see it as a blur. I had no torch, no night sight, no white card as an index that we read about so often to fit to the sights of a rifle to make night shooting easy. My old .405 did not even have a phosphorescent foresight. I realized I would have to act quickly while the tiger was still venting its wrath upon poor Mufu's remains. Once it became calmer and settled down to feed, it would notice any slight movement of my rifle and attack me. In fact, if it had eaten enough of the sandbar, it might just pass on to return later in the night when it became hungry again, or perhaps not return at all. Very cautiously I raised the stock of the .405 to my shoulder, taking the greatest care not to knock the barrel against any of the stones we had erected. 
Holding it firmly, I pointed the barrel as best I could at the front portion of the dark shape that was the tiger. I knew there was no possibility of picking my shot by firing at some vital place. I would have to take a chance. Perhaps I would miss altogether. Very likely I would just wound the tiger superficially and it would then turn and attack me. There was a hundred to one chance that I would kill it with my first shot. Steadying my hand and holding my breath, I pressed the trigger. Pandemonium broke loose as the sharp report of the rifle thundered out and echoed against the opposing range of hills. The tiger roared lustily. Fortunately, it had been facing away from me when I fired. Not knowing whence the shot had come, it imagined the foe was somewhere in front and sprang upon the nearest bush and began to tear it to shreds. As I feared would happen, I realized I had only wounded the tiger. It had been in a bad temper then. Now it was furious, and then I made a mistake. Had I done nothing, the tiger would have reduced the bush to nothing, and probably have gone away after that, without discovering my presence. But I fired again at its dark shape. After that the tiger's behavior was fearsome. Hit a second time, it catapulted itself into the air, fell to earth with a thud, and then began grubbing around in a circle. Evidently the spine was broken, for the animal appeared to be unable to stand upright. But this time it knew where its attacker was concealed, and the grubbing circle it was taking brought it directly down upon me. Scrambling to my feet, I fired my third shot into its head at a range of scarcely two yards. Then I vaulted over the stone parapet by using my hands and promptly fell down the other side. My feet pricked as if there were a thousand needles in each, for I had been sitting cross-legged for some eleven hours and they were numb. Fortunately, the tiger remained on the other side of the stones. A dreadful bubbling, gurgling sound was coming from it, showing that the animal was still alive but grievously hurt and probably dying. I scrambled to my knees as the blood flowed back to my legs and peeped cautiously over the intervening boulder. The tiger lay on the other side, twitching and gasping and gurgling. My fourth shot ended its suffering. When the noise died away, I could hear Byra calling to me frantically, asking if all was well. I answered him in the affirmative and told him to come along. A few minutes later my friend appeared out of the darkness, and I told him the whole story. Unerringly Byra led me through the dark jungle back to Monchi Hamlet. There, for the second time, I repeated all that had happened. The inhabitants turned out to the last child, brought lights and returned with us to bring in the bodies of Mufu and the tiger. My first shot had entered the stomach. My second had smashed the spine high up at the shoulder. It was this second shot that had anchored the tiger and prevented it from escaping. As we had anticipated, the man-eater turned out to be a young animal, and this accounted for his inexperienced erratic ways. The Pujaris asked why we had used the body of Mufu as a bait. We asked them why they entertained a sorcerer of such poor caliber in their midst. We also reminded them we had rid them of the man-eater. The end justified the means. To this, they said nothing. Hope you like the story, it would be cool if you subscribe and like.